Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to examine lean manufacturing techniques that you can possibly put into practice. We're going to focus on principle number one and principle number five. We're going to be looking at value from the customer's perspective, and we're going to look at ways that you can eliminate waste in the value stream as you're trying to service the customer's needs. Notice that principle number one is looking at things from the customer's perspective. And that's, uh, it's very important to try to do the best you can. But one of the neat things about being in the hobby maker business is you're a customer also. So you, if, as long as you treat your customers the way you want to be treated, you'll be fine. A couple tips for you. Be as honest as possible. The internet will find out charlatans and they will rip you on forums and stuff. Uh, be realistic. Stay in your lane. Do what you can with what you have where you're at. That's the Teddy Roosevelt quote. And avoid financial ruination. You can absolutely overcommit and overextend yourself. There are stories online of people who've lost their homes and have lost everything. So if you just come right out and say, look, I'm just some guy in a basement with a napkin, that's all I got. People will respect that. But don't give up hope um, because no matter what you do, it's not going to turn out as well as you thought it should. So just don't give up. Just keep plugging away. Let's look at one of the costs that you might have on your project, and that's IP costs. Rick Priestley recently gave an interview where he said Games Workshop paid 8% for the rights of Lord of the Rings. Think about those movies. Think about the publicity. It, it was enormous, and they paid 8% for that. And Lord of the Rings is the foundation of all fantasy genres, in my opinion. I personally contacted Fiat Chrysler about getting the license for Mopars, and the license cost 5%. Mopar is a legacy of classic muscle cars. 5% is, you know, not, that's just a decent rate in my opinion. But you're going to find that sometimes IP adds a significant cost to your customer's price. But just be aware of that. Ask yourself, is it worth it to the customer to pay this IP increase? Let's look at the highest royalties that I've been able to research online because of a discussion I was having with someone is 20%. The Beatles get 20% royalties. That's the, you know, the highest royalty rate that anyone gets. And they're fairly famous, let's be honest. Um, so, you know, they're getting 20%. A lot of times the IP will add a significant cost structure to your customers and you have to ask yourself, is it worth it to put that burden on them? So let's look at the cost to a customer in a store of a $100 product. The retail store is going to get around 40%. The distributor is going to get around 20%. Both of those are going to ask for free shipping. So the store is going to place a minimum order to get free shipping, the same with the distributor. So you're going to add some sh shipping costs to that. So what you're going to get out of that $100 product that you put in the store is around 30%. And if you're buying that from a supplier, say you're, you're buying it from China, you have to make a profit as well. So that, that creates a dilemma because you're going to be selling a product that you bought for 20 to $30 and you're going to try to resell it for $100. And that's pretty tight margins and that's it's kind of challenging. It, it can be done and it is kind of the standard way that things have been done in the past. But online retail has been upending this and I think there's going to be a lot of shakeout in this, you know, and there has been in the past. I'll give some examples. But just keep that in mind. This business model is essentially leveraging the difference in standard of livings between in, uh, in first world industrialized countries and you know lower cost places. So you need rich customers and poor employees. I saw a whole YouTube video where someone was talking about how this model just does, it's going to last forever. Now the retail store is, is great if you play there, but once again, if your customers, like I don't play in my local store because they don't have any of the games that really interest me. They, the, you know, that's not value added to me, but you're going to add that to the cost of your customers. And the other thing that's interesting is if you have to price based on retail, even the guys that are buying online are still paying the markup for retail, although the supplier sometimes gets that. So as a supplier, you're charging retail, but you're not going to retail. So that's the way that things were traditionally done for a long time. But things have changed a little bit with Kickstarter. So let's look at the same $100 product for Kickstarter. Kickstarter is run by Amazon. I believe they take around 10%. And then you have more shipping costs because you're shipping directly to each individual customer. If you're coming out of China, they can ship directly, and then they get that massive international discount, which is going to end in July, so that's going to upend things a little bit more. Um, so you can see your revenue is greatly increased if you go by Kickstarter there. 
and you can use that to lower the price to the product for the product or get better value and and you can see the results here of what Kickstarter has done to the tabletop games industry these are dollars pledged for tabletop games that I found a chart online and it's a lot of money it has become an extremely lucrative business it's no longer just a uh, hobbyist things I would say 20 years ago the tabletop games industry was a bunch of hobbyists it was a cottage industry and it's no longer that it's it's millions of dollars and these companies are doing quite well so it's sort of like um, the game has changed and the uh, the the bar has been raised substantially I know some of the CMON stuff that I got blew my mind the shipping costs are affecting me but they're also going to affect some of these Kickstarters because you have to ship to each individual customer so that does increase the cost just keep that in mind um, this is the makerspace model you do it yourself and you don't have to have an inventory my inventory is plastic pellets and you can ship direct to the customer uh, I do have some stores that carry my stuff but not that many I don't have any distributors the the cons of doing a makerspace is you got to do everything yourself with the equipment you have and you're always not you're never going to be up to par with the big established companies but you get the kind of the satisfaction of doing it yourself which is kind of nice um, I enjoy that aspect of it one of the things that I find interesting is that the majority of the industry seems to be focused on the super duper duper modelers um, like the guy that drives the f-450 with dually wheels and he buys a loaf of bread or the person who drives a Lamborghini and goes 10 miles an hour I don't I don't necessarily want to focus on them because first of all I can't number two I think that there's a lot of people that are not looking for that super duper high dollar miniature that deserves a Sam Lentz paint job and and you're you know you, you can't paint that way an odd motto is if your painting sucks so should your miniatures but that's weird so let's look at the uh, the principles here number one identifying values and that's something just look at the IP costs you're going to have the retail costs some of those things I don't particularly value I'm looking for generic miniatures I don't game in a store so for me to pay those costs it, it there's not adding value to me but it's adding costs and if a product is priced for retail even if I mail order it I'm still paying those increased costs it's just that the the manufacturer is pocketing them because I bought directly from the manufacturer likewise IP I bought a Latari L's from Room Wars because they were on fire sale from Fantasy Flight I'm never going to use them as Latari L's they're just going to go into my Warhammer Wood Elf Army but you know that I would never have paid the IP cost at full retail for them because I don't want the IP costs similarly there are a lot of um, games out there with a lot of IP costs involved in them and you have to ask is that is that a value for the customers so just keep that in mind when you're trying to make things just be open-minded with things and evaluate what you can do just sort of look at the customer's perspective what you can do to eliminate any waste or any additional cost to the customer that they don't necessarily want to pick up and in some ways you, you know you can't do that I think Kickstarter has done a brilliant job of focusing on lean manufacturing it has however um, decimated the cottage industry and taken the majority of it to, to China and it's it's well maybe not I mean there's there's still a lot of small guys that are going Kickstarter so I guess it's been good for a lot of things but it's definitely changing things so just keep that in mind so these are just my own personal opinions and tips take it with a grain of salt and keep trying it's the way it works